So when we hear about GDP numbers in the news and stuff like that, right, we have to remember that governments and news organizations report the GDP growth as an what's called an annualized rate. So what we actually are getting is we are calculating the growth from one quarter of the year. So from, you know, Q1 to Q2 or something like that, right? So we divide the year into four quarters for various financial reporting purposes and stuff like that, right? So in reality, we calculate the growth from quarter one to quarter two and then multiply it by four when it's reported. Now, what is the underlying assumption here? The underlying assumption is that the economy grew at that rate for a full year instead of just for a quarter. Zoom time. When we're talking about real GDP and the business cycle, two of the big buzzwords, especially these days, are recession and depression. So recession we defined as a significant decline in national output or GDP. So this is typically two to three quarters consecutively. I cannot spell consecutively right now. In a row. Of negative growth. The, the real big bad one, the big D word, is depression. Haven't had one of those for 100 years. We almost had one in 2008. Turned out to just be a long, lengthy recession with a, uh, well, not lengthy recession. It was long, it was kind of a medium-sized recession with a lengthy, slow recovery. Could have, could have, uh, could have evolved into a depression if we hadn't have done the unprecedented fiscal and monetary policy that we did. So a depression is defined as an especially lengthy and deep decline in output. So, you know, the Great Depression, it was, you know, one out of four people were unemployed. The stocks, you know, a lot of the stocks lost like a third of their value overnight. Um, and it, you know, it took many, many, many years for that decline in output to be reversed. So for the most part in the United States, we have seen, you know, an upward trending real GDP. Of course, there's been some bouts of, you know, uh, rapid growth and there's been some bouts of, uh, you know, decline, right? And so how do we talk about those things when we're talking about uh, GDP and expansion and recessions, right? So let's let's get some uh, some terms defined here. So this is our section that's on patterns of recessions and expansions. So the first one we'll talk about is a peak. A peak is during a, the real business cycle. So 
sometimes abbreviated as the RBC. This is the highest point of output before a recession begins, or really just before any kind of decline in economic activity. like a recession. A trough, a little brighter, a trough is again in the real business cycle this is the lowest point of output. And so this is usually before a recovery of some sort begins. We think of recessions lasting from peak to trough, whereas economic expansions or economic upswings run from trough to peak. So this business cycle is the relatively short-term movement in and out of recessions. So graphically, time, GDP, real GDP. So graphically, it's you know something like this, where this is a recession this is an expansion this is a trough and these two are peaks This whole thing is the real business cycle. Questions on those definitions? Um, yeah. Didn't we have uh, two negative growth of G GDP in like September? So were we in a recession then? Yes. Uh, that has been well, well politicized and debated in terms of that's, and that's part of why the, the definition has never exactly been two, you know, consecutive quarters. Um, that's why some people say three, some people say two. That's not just a new thing because of kind of what's going on. But um, but yeah, we did have two consecutive quarters of decline. And then the third quarter was positive. And I think the only reason it was positive was because of like strong consumer spending or something like that. So it wasn't even like a great reason that it was positive uh, by that the third quarter uh, to avoid the recession or whatever the case may be. So yeah, at the end of the day, you, you want to kind of take a deeper dive into this and take a look at, you know, uh, just because it's a local minimum or local maxima, just because it's a peak or a trough, you know, how bad is it, right? I think that's part of the issue too. If it's negative expansion two quarters in a row, but it's only, you know, 0.3% or something like that, that's not as, that's not as worrisome as, you know, negative expansion that's, you know, 10% or something, right? So, um, you know, oftentimes we want to simplify really complex things into just one number uh, to say, you know, whether something's good or bad, right? Um, but uh, using multi, multiple variables and multiple kind of avenues of looking at something is usually the best way to get, a, to get an impression 
as to what's happening in, in the economy, right? Um, you know, we want to simplify and say, well, the economy's bad right now, or the economy's good right now. But at the end of the day, it's usually mixed, right? You know, some parts of the economy are good and growing, some parts of the economy are struggling. You know, uh, overall, right? That's kind of what we're trying to to do in macroeconomics. That's what the government and the the Federal Reserve is trying to do. They're trying to say overall kind of what is happening and where should we be pumping money into, where should we give, be giving tax breaks to, um, you know, so on and so forth. So, so does that have to do with anything that's affecting the U.S. dollar collapsing now? Or, um... uh, so there's been a lot of talk about the U.S. dollar, you know, the, 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 the what is it, the, um, I forget exactly what the term is called, but it's, there's been a lot of talk for 20 years about, you know, the, the dollar collapsing and, you know, China flooding the market with our, you know, U.S. treasuries and stuff like that, right? At the end of the day, the dollar is 90% of 200% of all the foreign, foreign exchange transactions, right? So it's pretty much on one side of every foreign exchange transaction. It's still you know, one of the reserve currencies of the world in terms of, you know, 60% of all of the central banks of the world ha like is, is denominated in dollars and U.S. treasuries, right? And as the interest rates of our treasuries go up, it just makes holding dollars more appealing because, you know, it used to be, oh, you have a trillion, you know, you have, you have a trillion, you know, dollars in terms of U.S. treasury bills, but that barely pays anything. But now, you know, if you have that same amount of U.S. treasury bills, if they're at least denominated or if they're, um, you know, more relatively, more more recently purchased, then they're going to be paying a higher interest rate, and so you're going to you're going to be more financially incentivized to continue to contribute to the dollar hegemony or hegemonic system, or however you say that word, right? So there's a lot of inertia in the current system that so the, like the big the, the the very interesting thing was that in 2008 we had this great financial collapse. And it was essentially our fault. It was the United States' fault. It was our regulators' fault. It was our greedy, you know, banks' fault. I mean, there's all these like Wells Fargo, you know, got in trouble because they, you know, were forcing companies or they were forcing people, they were scamming people into having eight bank accounts. And they had this whole eight is great. So you need to make sure every one of your customers has eight different bank accounts for no reason except they could charge the fines. So it was our fault in a lot of different reasons. But the interesting thing that happened is that because in a time of economic insecurity, the dollar is this safe haven asset, even though it was our fault, the response that happened strengthened the dollar's hold on the international economy, right? Similar kind of thing happened during COVID. I mean, not to say that COVID was our fault, but a similar kind of thing that, you know, in these times of stress and, and, and trials for different companies and economies, they, fl they, they flee to the relative stability of the US dollar. So has it been collapsing? I mean, because in my, it, 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 everything that I've been reading has been showing that like the dollar's just been getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And I have a friend that went to Columbia over spring break and she came back and she was like, everything was so cheap. And I was like, really? I went just like four years ago and things were not cheap, you know? And so again, I, I, I think that the, the dollar has been getting um, stronger because of the flight to safety. Um, the other thing is that, uh, and this will be an interesting thing we'll discuss uh, in class on Wednesday, but um, productivity has finally like kind of exploded out of this like upward bound that it had, you know? And so essentially during the pandemic, you know, a lot of these companies fired a bunch of people and automated a bunch of stuff and realized that, oh, we can make the same amount of revenue and pay less people. And so when we, sh when we look at the productivity numbers, like we're gonna see, you know, there was, a, there was a great increase in productivity because of the IT revolution in the 90s and the 2000s stuff, and then it kind of petered off and then in 2020, it jumped to a new level again, right? And so um, there's been a, a high, there's been a huge increase in automation and robotization in U.S. industries, and so I think that's another factor that's causing more investment in the United States into companies like Amazon and Walmart and stuff like that, which is further strengthening the dollar, if that makes sense. Yeah, but there's a lot of talk about the the was hard landing, I think, of the U.S. dollar. I think that's what I'm that's what I'm thinking of. There's been a lot of talk about that for a long time, though. And at the end of the day, uh, like I said, where there's so much inertia in the current system, 
And the other part of it, too, is if you want to have a really boring read, my dissertation is on the monetary consequences of our military spending abroad. And so um, I also posited that, you know, our huge, you know, economic and military aid engine, where we flood the rest of the world with a ton of money, also reinforces and contributes to that dollar hegemony system because essentially in order to keep their exchange rates constant they have to buy more and more u.s treasury bills as we flood their uh, economy with more dollars so slight tangent there um but leads us into uh, a segue for 6.4 which we'll pick up in uh first thing on wednesday let's do our kahoot <laughs> 